Robert Graham is a well-known cybersecurity expert. He created the Black Ice Personal Firewall in 1998 and created the first network IPS. Recently, he created MassScan, which can scan all 4 billion addresses of the Internet within a few minutes. Robert regularly writes on technical topics, cyber rights, and tech policy. Please welcome Rob and Dale to the S4 main stage. Thank you. So I'm really excited that we got Robert down here because he is at least in my top three favorite Twitterers. Uh, he is just a lot of fun to follow, and, and uh, that's why we put his Twitter handle up there so you could follow him. Uh, a lot of times he will take, and, and probably not just to be contrarian, but you will take a, a point of view when almost everyone is saying things are this way, you'll be the lonely voice that says, well, wait a minute, maybe they're actually that way. And, and I find that very interesting. And a number of the areas you've done that on directly affect this audience, so I thought maybe we'd talk about some of those. Okay? Sound fair? Sounds fair. Is that a fair characterization, or do you think I'm being too tough on you? Oh, no, not, not nearly tough enough. Okay. Okay. So one of the areas you write a lot about is IoT. Right. And uh, maybe we'll start just on some of the, like the UK document on IoT and the California document on IoT. You've had some comments about those in terms of what's good and bad about them. Maybe if we start from a macro standpoint, should states and countries be putting out this type of guidance? And if so, what should we be looking for from them? Well, the, the problem that states have is that when they put out guidance, it, it impacts people, and the impact may not be to improve security, it might hurt innovation. And that has costs. So take, for example, medical devices. Is we all don't want our heart, our pacemaker to be hacked by someone who then kills us. And that's a big danger. But on the other hand, if you overregulate that, trying to fix all possible security problems in pacemakers, it raises the costs and lowers innovation. So how many people died because they did not have an, uh, a new pacemaker with new capability or an insulin pump that was internet enabled that monitored your, your blood sugar levels better or some other life-saving innovation that did not happen this year and happened three years from now because they follow government regulations. So um, improving security may mean killing people because they did not have these innovations on time. So I worry about government guidance that it's, it's often ignorant of, of these sorts of concerns. And we've had some actual uh, medical devices recalled, but I don't think that's, do you think it's, to date, has it slowed down progress in getting new systems out? It's already a pretty slow process, so the last thing we need to do is slow it down more. Do you yeah, think it's it, happened it's yet? Hard, it's hard to actually measure this and actually know whether this assertion is correct because we just don't know. Did, did that product happen late or, you know, we don't see the products that didn't happen. Like right. Some startup uh, didn't produce a product because they couldn't afford the regulatory uh, costs involved. We don't see that that failed to appear. So it's, it's almost impossible to measure this. Though the FDA itself does recognize this problem, that they, are, they try to, to stop regulating some things sometimes because they recognize that they've made things too expensive sometimes to develop. So we know this problem exists, but it's hard to measure. Okay, so before I ask the next question, maybe we'll ask a, a poll out here. And, and please raise your hand, don't be shy. It's about auto update in IoT devices. Do you think IoT devices should have auto update? Raise your hand. Everyone participating, I hope? <laughs> okay. Who thinks IoT devices should not have auto update? So actually, what would you say, a little more not? Or it a was pretty close, not. but pretty close. Pretty close. You have some strong opinions about auto update and also the fact that some of these regulatory approaches or guidance documents are saying that auto update should be a mandatory feature of any of these. Right. Uh, uh, two years ago, we had the Mirai event. Um, where a worm took control of hundreds of thousands of machines, IoT machines throughout the internet, and DDoS 
uh, a DNS provider. It took down popular websites, including Twitter. And that set the tone for lawmakers. They really want to pass laws based upon their understanding of Mirai. And one of those items is the lack of updates. A lot of these devices could not be updated and weren't updated. And so you look at the legislation coming from the federal government and uh, other areas, they want to, first of all, demand that patching is possible. And, but on IoT, you, know, you have a little you know, device that's you know, under this chair or behind the, uh, the platform, and no one can touch it. No one's going to ever update it, even if it is theoretically patchable. So the obvious solution is to make it auto-patching so that the next bug that threatens the internet can quickly get patched by the vendor before uh, it takes down the internet. And that's a great story, except that um, that's not the major uh, threat that we have today. Mirai was IPv4, and you can add 10 billion devices to the internet and not actually expand the exposure of IoT devices on the internet because they can't all have an IPv4 address. They all have to go behind NATs or use an IPv6. And the possibility of a worm of all these future devices is actually not quite as severe as you think it is. There's not going to be another Mirai because the, the number of IoT devices that have IPv4 goes down every year, not up. But what could happen is that a vendor of an IoT uh, device, even a small vendor can easily have a million devices out on the internet somewhere, all behind NATs, all unexploitable from the public internet. But then a hacker pops that vendor, uh, grabs the private key, signs a firmware update with their virus or their malware or whatever, and then pushes it out to those million devices. And within moments, they now have a million device botnet. And that's far bigger than Mirai and can be far more damaging than Mirai. So you solved a problem over here that you really don't have. It's kind of a miscomprehension or a superficial understanding of what happened with Mirai, and you've created this much larger problem. Much larger than Mirai was the NotPetya attack, the, the malware front that hit the Ukraine and then spread to the rest of the world and took out companies like the shipping giant Maersk, causing billions of dollars of damage. That caused more damage than Mirai, and that was done by uh, launching that with a, an update to the, uh, the MeDoc accounting software because they had auto update on their software. So this is a huge danger that we're going towards fleeing a, a small danger toward a larger danger. So we have auto update for security reasons, right? And, and I guess it's, it's mainly, it's actually just allowing the vendor to have a capability of updating their software periodically for security reasons or not. You know, I wonder though, aren't, consumers going to demand the capability of updating their system, not just for security reasons, but also just new features and functionalities as these things develop. Uh, uh, even if we set aside the security, it would almost seem like that would be a feature that would just be part of any offering you'd have if you want to be competitive. Yeah, it's true. Though we have to remember that IoT is not one class of device. It's sure. thousands of different subclasses. Uh, I have a car that very famously um, updates itself about once every month with new features. And um, sometimes it's quite impressive that they've added some great new feature to the car. Other times it's kind of annoying. The windshield wipers have stopped working correctly because of some new software update. But yeah, there's lots of devices in my home that I want Updates, frequent updates in my car, my TV. Uh, Samsung has this new uh, whole kitchen set with these great things that run apps on your, your, your fridge. That probably needs updates. And I'll, and I'll probably want that. And these are also major vendors. What I don't need, though, is a software update for my light bulb or for uh, the, my Christmas tree, uh, Christmas tree controller that I got this year to control my Christmas lights. There was a Christmas light vendor, Twinkly, that got uh, had major vulnerabilities in their, in their stuff, but it's a fairly small threat. It's going to be behind a NAT, and I just don't care what happens with my Christmas lights. I'll just buy a new one next year at Costco. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I had Dan Gear on this stage last year, and you know I've exchanged emails with him. He seems to be very much opposed to uh, having a lot of these types of things uh, forced on him, whether it be a smart meter or anything else. You seem to be more of a position of embracing 
all these new capabilities and, and products. Is, is that accurate? How would you say you're, where are you in the adopter phase of, of this sort of thing? Um, I'm not so much uh, eagerly embracing it as this I've given in to the future. Is these, uh, putting a CPU and memory in a network stack on a device is so incredibly cheap, it, it becomes impractical to have a light bulb that doesn't have a network stack. You know, these little ESP32 modules, they cost a couple dollars and they're practical to put in almost any device and they have a Wi-Fi TCP IP stack. So it becomes inevitable whether I want, to, want it to resist it or want to embrace it, I'm going to have everything be uh, internet enabled if it's got electricity in the future. And from my point of view as a researcher, I might as well just get on board with it and just start getting everything in my home internet enabled because, you know, as an expert, you know, understand this stuff and be on the forefront rather than trying to figure it out by going to other people's homes and hacking them. And then uh, over the holidays, you can provide tech support for your family, right? Yes, and it's, I, I did that this, uh, this recent holiday, and my dad's disk drive went out, so I replaced it with an SSD, and that was great. But I also uh, forced upon him to get Alexa, uh, get his Christmas lights going with Alexa, so we turned them on and off every night with Alexa. Um, I took a look at, they have a, a, uh, a car that uh, some vulnerabilities were, were released on, so I played around with that and tried to hack in my own way to the car, and uh, was unsuccessful. Uh, USB devices can sometimes have serial port, you know, the, the virtual serial port over USB that you mm. can enable. So from a little Raspberry Pi, you can sometimes hack cars. Well, let's, let's go back to, so another comment you had on IoT is, if I got this right, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not a fan of the generic no default password requirement. Right. Um, again, looking at Mirai, uh, superficially, it looks like it was your, the typical default password problem that we all have been dealing with for 20 years. When I first saw Mirai, I was like, oh, that's just the t typical default password problem that we have on it. But we, we look more deeply into this, and that's not what happened. Uh, with IoT devices, we have two sets of passwords. We have those, like in the app, when we connect with the web interface. And then we have uh, the one built into the operating system, whether it's QNX or, or Linux or something, there's often like an et cetera a password file that has like the root password in there. But we don't log in with root ever on these devices. That's not what it's there for. A lot of devices just have it so disabled that there's, it exists. It's in the file, the password is there, but there's no telnet, no SSH, nothing that I can use to access that device using that password. So it, it technically exists, but it's, it's meaningless. PlayStation a Classic has their recent device that has that. There's a password there, uh, exists, but there's no use for it. There's no way you can ever use that password for anything useful. Now, you had, um, you had some comments on the UK code of practice regarding IoT, and that one, it seemed like you were more favorable. There were, there were things that you actually liked about that document. Is there anything other people that are writing documents that are setting standards for, or, or, or even just giving guidelines for IoT security that they should learn from that? They had, first of all, it was a document that covered not just the IoT devices itself, but also said, hey, what's the private information send, sending up to the cloud? So they didn't just try to focus on this one narrow area with blinders on, they tried to look at the whole problem. Second of all, they had additional documents that uh, had technical information. As a techie, I don't want just that nice little PDF that's one page long with 11 uh, bullet items. I want to get to the actual technical details of what they're actually talking about. And so much that happens in the policy world or the guidance world is there is no technical information, like no default passwords or no default credentials. Well, what is it, when you say no default credentials, but I've got a private, I've got the public key on my device for, for, for recognizing uh, valid signed updates. And that's a hard-coded credential, so your guidance is conflicting. And so uh, the UK document actually had a technical basis for a lot of their stuff, and it was really great to be able to go, go into it and get to the technical details. Would you say that you talk, when you talk about IoT and these documents and guidance, you, you have weaved in this concept of virtual sig virtu virtue signaling? that uh, you essentially, you're doing this to describe what is moral and proper and right as opposed to what is effective and actually useful to the consumers. Right. Is where, 
maybe differentiate a little bit between or with some examples of what would be virtue signaling and what might actually be something useful? Well, a, a, a lot of uh, advice is uh, don't do X, like don't have default passwords. And um, that tends to be virtue signaling. Uh, the, the US government put out a document for children about how to be safe online. And most of that was virtue signaling, like, you know, don't sext your friends. When it really needs to have more details, like if you do sex your friends, you can get arrested, convicted, and put on a sex offender list for the rest of your life, even though you are only 13 and you don't think you're committing a crime. And so um, the whole bit about saying don't do X does not really help people make decisions. They're saying, believe me, I'm the expert, don't do X. And we're not helping them understand the consequences. If you do do X, here are the consequences that you have. And so I, all, all this sort of guidance is, is largely do it because security is your moral duty and not here are the costs and benefits involved. Let's, let's shift a little bit. Another area that I found very interesting, and, and what is your website for your, where you write your blog, where you write your articles? What's that? So my website is blog.erratasec.com, E-R-R-A-T-A-S-E-C.com. And so I write a couple blog posts a month, uh, a couple are technical, I kind of weave in the ones that are more, you know, opinion, uh, and try to balance them out with just a purely technical post, right. try to like, because um, opinion's often crap. So the technical details makes me just, justifies me having the blog. And, and a lot of these questions are from, you know, I, I kind of start in the Twitter and then I see what you wrote about it on your blog. And, and another area you talked a lot about is this idea of who is the real threat? Is it really this nation state? So the, the audience in S4 is much more ICS, you know, traditional ICS, utilities, manufacturers, uh, mining, things of that nature, and the vendors that support those. And, and of course, this is morphing and changing over the years. But one of the things I found really interesting was this idea that maybe the threat that we have to worry most about isn't some very sophisticated nation state. But you wrote that uh, these aren't the careful planning of a small state actor trying to accomplish specific goals. These are the actions of an actor that supports hacker groups and lets them loose without a lot of oversight and direction. So essentially, we might actually, which if I understood you, you're saying we might actually be at more risk, not from the people that a lot of people describe on stage here, these very sophisticated nation state actors, but people are funded by them without specific targets and they're just said, let loose and cause problems. Right, that comment was specifically about North Korea and WannaCry. And we look at WannaCry and as, as, as hackers, we kind of know what happened with WannaCry is that it was, um, they didn't have a specific goal in mind. And we know that because we know it's impossible to know the, the, how WannaCry would actually turn out. We've had 20 years experience with worms and we know that when I launch a worm, I have no, no clue what might happen. It might go gangbusters, it might be far more successful than I thought, or it might fizzle out and be unsuccessful for unknown reasons why I didn't even anticipate. And so we know that WannaCry was not the careful planning of a nation state going after a specific target. We know it was some researcher who said, hey, what happens if I put the eternal blue uh, exploit in my ransomware and then launch it and let me see what happens, because I'm curious. And we look at uh, North Korea's efforts in general, they don't have a, a, an intelligence group, you know, there's their cyber army focused on doing these attacks. They are supporting groups often outside of North Korea giving them funding, giving them goals, and giving them direction, um, where those then do random attacks all over the place, trying to earn money via Bitcoin, or you know, doing all sorts of various things, and it's not quite as directed from the top on down as we think. We also see that uh, with the Syrian uh, cyber army, or maybe even the anonymous hackers, is that they aren't directed by a single goal, they are more opportunistic, looking for things that serve their needs that they might be able to hack. So we don't have, so our model shouldn't be they're coming after me to cause a power blackout. It should be they're doing all sorts of random things that they'll do a power blackout if they can, but you know, they might do something else if they can do that instead. And how does that tie in then to, you define this as being related to the birthday problem. How does that tie into that? 
The birthday attack is a very, or the birthday paradox, or the birthday attack, is a very famous, uh, well, first of all, paradox, that in a room of, of people, how many people have, are likely to have the same birthday? And the number where it's 50-50 chance is, I think, 27 or 23, somewhere, somewhere around there. And that's surprising, because your, your model that you have in your mind is, what's the chance someone has the same birthday as me? Well, for that to be likely, you're going to need a room of, like, a few hundred people. That, you know, of, of this audience, chances are, are maybe even that one person has the same birthday as mine. Which is January 1st, of course, because that's where hackers always have their birthdays. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, but if it's, if it's any two people, the, the, your, your odds vary different, uh, very greatly. And when uh, attacking uh, hashes for crypto hashes, it's called the birthday attack, is if I have a file with a well-known hash, the difficulty for me using MD5 to create a duplicate is a 2 to the power of 128. But starting with two, any two files that any two can change, either can change, and to eventually meet in the middle, it's uh, 2 to the power of uh, 64. So it's, it's half the number of bits of, of security. And so then we look at than like North Korea doing their attacks, if they have to do one specific attack, like take out the power grid in New York City, that's very difficult. They have, you know, they have to get a lot of things right. It's very hard to do. If their goal then is instead, let's cause power outages anywhere we can throughout the United States, the, the difficulty goes way down. It's easy, it's trivial to cause a power blackout somewhere in the United States. So it's very hard for me to choose one target. It's, it's very easy for me to take and attack and, and let, well, whatever targets I can. So we have some, we have some people that do threat intelligence here and provide services to this type of audience. How do you, how do they deal with this sort of thing? I mean, if, if you know, if you can find the motivation behind someone attacking, you can maybe better predict who might be trying to target you and what they might be trying to accomplish. If you have this issue where they're just looking for targets of opportunity. How are you supposed to deal with that in your threat intel program? It's really hard. Um, I, I sometimes appear in their threat intelligence feeds. Um, well, we, had, we, had, we actually had a digital bond employee that I think Bloomberg said was living in Chattanooga who was the third biggest risk to ICS in the world and he was just scanning from his home kind of right. like you do. When Shellshock came up, the, uh, the NSA did a briefing where I was like the fourth largest uh, threat or exploiter of Shellshock <laughs> because I'd run an internet scan looking for Shellshock. And so it was like Russia, Iran, then me. And so that was pretty funny. Uh, but, but one incident that happened was really kind of interesting is that I, I hear from the intelligence community that they had an emergency once because I'd scanned the entire internet for something. And this intelligence agency had looked and said, hey, this, this hacker's coming after us. They know about our public IP address space. We see their scans there. But somehow they figured out that we also own this other private secret address space that no one's supposed to know about. So how do they know that we own this address space? We see the same scan across both of them. And of course, what they're not really quite being able to, to, to process is that I'm scanning the entire internet. I'm not scanning just this one and that one. I don't know that they're associated. And so their threat model of, well, no one would ever scan the internet, that if I see a scan here and there, it must be someone coming after me particularly. And so th they didn't quite process that, that motivation. And so I think that's a, a common problem with, with threat intel is we see these come, we see the data, but, and we surmise, you know, if they were us, what our intentions would be if that were the data, but they could be completely different. I want, I want to go back to that original original question, but why are you scanning the internet? What's, what, what are you trying to learn or, or achieve, or what's, what's your plan for that? So I scan the internet be because I can, because I have a box in Nicolo, and I've got a tool that can scan the internet, so it's fun and it's interesting. Um, and I think that's where a lot of security research comes from. If you ask any security researcher, why did you hack your car, or why did you do this, why did you do that? And it's because, well, I have the skill set. I've got the understanding of that particular problem, and I'm interested in it, and so I go forward with it. Okay. I just, I was curious by that. I, I, I'd never really thought about that. Um, so, but I still am questioning, you know, I think what you said you, was actually very, 
uh, different than we typically think of it. We think of threat actors as nation states, people that may specifically be wanting to target specific asset owners or specific sectors. And maybe in some cases they hire someone else to do that specific thing. But if, if we have a case where you know, someone is hired just to try to take down anything that could be considered ICS, how is someone supposed to consider that threat agent? How, I mean, how do they, it, it's really hard to figure out what their motivation is, who it is, how serious you have to take them. Have you seen anyone actually trying to ad adapt their threat intel model to that type of, I guess, threat? Um, uh, to a large part is, uh, when, when you open that up so broadly, the only solution is, is to focus on securing the systems regardless of the threat. If your focus is on who's doing it, that's, you know, for, for, for ourselves, it's really hard for us to deal with that. The government, our government should be dealing with that, but we, we can't do that. It might be Russia uh, today that we're worried about being in our power grid, but tomorrow it might be anonymous. And so instead of focusing on who it is, we have to focus on the what. How are they likely to hack in? So the classic TTP sort of stuff that... Right. And, and are you, do you think then that they're basically just copying each other, so you're not seeing a lot of novel attacks from these groups? Luckily, that's actually the case. Is that, we do, you know, even when we're thinking about nation state hackers, like maybe Russia putting all their effort to take out my power grid to cause a blackout in my city, they don't really have... Um, the most advanced hackers. They have phishing attacks, they have uh, scans on the network, uh, they've got malware. Um, the, the, the techniques that they're using or Anonymous is using or this 13-year-old in their parents' basement is using. Uh, um, Germany had this problem recently where uh, some hacker divulged the, the personal details of a thousand of the top politicians and artists in the country. And it was a 20-year-old in their parents' basement who it turned out to be just doing normal 20-year-old level of attacks um, that 20-year-old might, might do, like phishing attacks. And so um, we don't have to focus on who, we just have to focus on the basics. And so in the ICS world, what we've seen is, and, and because it's so successful, we've seen people spearfish or other ways get onto the enterprise network, find who can remotely access the control system, steal their credentials, and then just reside on there until they want to push the button. So I guess if we looked at the model where you're, you're targeted for whatever reason or your, your mission for whatever reason is to compromise a number of a certain types of control systems, then you can just follow that process right. and, and be successful. Now, you mentioned also that Stuxnet was maybe the only example where we're kind of the contra-example or right. counter-example. Exactly. Do you think we're going to have more Stuxnets, or do you think that is really an outlier? Um, Stuxnet, again, is, is, so I have all this good spiel about how you just, your threat's phishing or spear phishing or simple yep. things. And then Stuxnet happens, which was a nation state attack, yep. as far as we can tell. And it was advanced, really, you know, O-Days being used. It was, it was um, unprecedented the way that they had used the USB drive to get into an air gap system. It was unprecedented, it was advanced, it was everything we fear about what might happen to us. And um, I, don't, I don't really fear that happening as a, uh, something that, that, that will happen again to us uh, so much as when we see a new attack appear, there certainly will be ones, uh, like using USB drives to get malware, we actually have that problem today mm -hmm. in ICS systems. Uh, we just know how that system gets infected. Oh, this consultant with a USB drive. So um, it does happen, but we see them coming, generally. Um, w when people use Stuxnet-type techniques, we'll see them get developed over time rather than just the sudden advance in, in hacking capability. Okay. I, I want to talk about one final area, and I'm not sure it's as directly applicable to ICS, but maybe we can meander over in that direction. And that's, you, you back this summer, you had this thread about seatbelts. Right. And and the questioning whether seat belts actually save lives. And, and it was, you thought that maybe people would change their behavior because of seat belts. That, that really kind of pushed people back because they, I think the general reaction was you're a little bit crazy. Seat belts have been proven to save lives. Right. But 
what would even even if you don't believe the end argument, what would be the argument that seatbelts may not save as many lives as one might think? Well, seatbelts is one of those good things you, you started this whole talk with, is that everyone knows that seatbelt saves lives. It's it's just something you would not disagree with. So obviously, I have to go and, and champion the opposite. And when we look <laughs> at the data, it, it, there's actually a lot of support for my position that you you look at seatbelt adoption. And we, we don't see that as actually being as effective as people claim. Um, we, we don't see like when a, a state says, hey, there's one day that we have now a new seatbelt law and adoption goes from 40% to 80% now within a few months. You don't see a dramatic reduction in car deaths due to the seatbelts. The statistics you do see that support seatbelt have all been cherry picked. Like this one study over here saw something, even though my, that same event that happened in other places, it never happened again. And so we're cherry picking data to support the conclusion that seatbelts work. And why might not they work? If they're not working, well, why is that the case? And uh, economists have a good description of this. Uh, they would call it risk compensation that when a driver wears a seatbelt, they feel safer. And when they feel safer, they will take more risks. And it's something we don't accept about ourselves, that we will deliberately take more risks when we feel safer, but we know it must be true. If I slow down and, and drive more carefully when it's raining and snowing out, I must then logically, when it gets sunnier, I must deliberately be less careful and be driving faster uh, because now the sun came out and it got safer. So I, even though I don't accept the model personally, I, it, we, we know it must be true that when I feel too safe, I take more risks. And so that's what we see with seatbelts, ABS braking, and all these other car uh, safety features. The ones that the drivers know about, um, consistently when they do studies, they, they see that the drivers take more risks. They pay less attention, they listen to the radio and, and sing along with it, they do their makeup, um, they, they pay less attention. Uh, and so when we, when we see things that are add safety, we see more risks. Uh, so economists would describe this as if you want to reduce the number of automobile deaths, put a big spike right in the, the uh, steering column pointing at, some, at the driver's chest. <laughs> and they will, risk compensation means they'll be more careful. And so that, that describes a lot of what we think we're improving safety and security, but often we don't because there's this theoretical, there's in theory, there's actually good theory out there why these things won't be successful. And as it turns out, they often are not as successful. So you think that the argument there is, is primarily the risk compensation aspect of it or that they just not, might not be, even with the same driving, they might not be saving as many lives as the studies show? Well, it, they have lots of different numbers. I, the reason I'm trying to tie that is, okay. is, as you were discussing it, I was thinking, the closest thing I can tie that to is antivirus. Right. You know, because we are still, we actually had an S4 debate, I think it was back in 2012, when will antivirus no longer be necessary in control systems? And we're, we're starting to see people pull it out. You know, they're saying it's just not worth all the effort, it's an attack vector, it's, um, you know, we're, we're isolated, maybe we're running application whitelisting, we feel we're actually safer not creating those holes in security permanent, a whole set of arguments. And I'm wondering, um, well, maybe I'll just put it this way. What is your feeling on the future of antivirus in something like an industrial control system? Well, you mentioned spear phishing before. And one reason spear phishing works is because antivirus, because they get a link and they say, well, I'll click on it because I don't, I'm not afraid to click on it because antivirus will catch it. If, there, if that was a hostile email, if that was a hostile program I shouldn't be running, um, I, I, if it is, so what, antivirus will catch it. So we have the risk compensation that if I add a firewall, if I add antivirus, my behavior changes and I take more risks as just an individual employee because I know, hey, the security team will take care of it. And we have in, in the ICS world, a lot of times there's uh, folders and such that are excluded from antivirus that are very well known. So you could actually be in the case where you think the antivirus is running, but because the historian is always updating the files in this folder, it's not scanned and, and you could fall into that trap. Well, we all know the problem, especially as antivirus gets 
you know, more aggressive with things like heuristics and stuff, the more often there's false positives and we have to start excluding more from it. So again, people behave in a way they think, hey, I'm secure, and, but n actually this was disabled there and there actually is no protection there and you're not secure. Okay, well, let me, let me ask you just kind of a very open-ended question to finish it off. You, you have had experience in ICS. I, you know, I've, I've read that you've right. actually been into physical facilities where these things are run and you've met oh, yeah. the people and you've seen the protocols, so you, you have all that. What do you think uh, maybe is the advancement or the, the progress we should be pushing towards most? What should we be doing that we're not doing today that would maybe have the biggest impact? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, one thing is, I, I think we need to give up on some of the old models. Uh, we, we have things like firewalling and antivirus and patching is like, you know, our mainstay. And maybe we need to say, well, patching is not going to work because there's all these reasons, especially in ICS, why patches can't be applied. Like, I would rather be infected with the virus and as long as the plant's still running and I'll eventually fix it on the next maintenance cycle. So um, patching's not going to work, so what else can we do? Well, network segmentation would be a, a far more valuable thing. It's, I don't care if, I'm, if I've got, you know, old Windows systems that can be uh, infected with configure if I can separate them out on its own network segments. And we now have software-defined networking or VLANs and switches. Even the cheapest sw home switches you get for for the home now have these features to segment things so I can have all my insecure IoT deployment but that's okay because almost nothing can reach it. We're sort of fighting these conflicting views of the world of I want to have a network where it's just the network and I put everything on the network whereas traditionally in industrial systems I had like serial connections that were only that one connection and I think we need to focus on stop thinking of this as the network and go back to that model of I have only, I have well-defined connections between any two points and nothing else can con connect and I can't get a, a laptop connected on that, that segment because it's not allowed and it's not going to spread a virus. So we have that functionality to do a lot more segmentation and we should focus on maybe that being our primary goal rather than trying to patch things against configure. And are you doing that on your home network? Yeah, my home network is actually, I've done that with the home switch, is that all my IoT stuff is all off on separate networks. I've only got one device that is on all the VLANs I use when I want to scan everything and hack my own, my home, my own home. But those IoT devices cannot reach anything other than uh, the internet if I allow them to or the, the one thing that can scan everything. Great. Well, I appreciate you coming to S4. I encourage everyone to follow Rob, read his stuff. It's, it's really great stuff. I think it will definitely make you think. You're not always going to agree with it. No, sometimes you're, you're you're not gonna, most of the time you won't agree with me. Sometimes I think he's just trying to cause trouble. But, uh, but it's always a fun read. And thank you, Rob, for coming to S4. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.